Good evening, this is Haunted Antiques Paranormal Research Centre and this is Paranormal Peeps with Jacqueline Dixon and tonight's guest is Simon Entwistle. Hi Simon, how are you Hello, doing? Hello. I'm very, very well thanks Jacqueline, looking forward to this very much indeed. Thanks for very kindly inviting me. That's fantastic, I actually watched one of your films last night, uh, just before bed, so yeah, <laughs> great time. <laughs> No nightmares though, it's just fantastic. And I sort of will look at other ones as well because yes. I just love the stories. I love the atmosphere as well and the what you created really as a story. Um, I find a, a good ghost story can get the imagination going, Jacqueline, really. Yeah, that's right. But you, you were that precise. You didn't need much imagination. You gave you, everyone such a picture of what was oh, actually happening fantastic. and the characters. Yeah. You really built the story up, which was absolutely amazing. Yeah, I really enjoyed that, actually. I thought, yeah, I'll just check this. I thought, I'm talking to you today. So, yeah, we'll check this out. So, uh, where did all this start then? Well, um, I left school at the age of 14. Um, I didn't have any qualifications whatsoever. I had a string of very, very boring jobs, really. And then in 1975, I joined the army and I was sent to the infantry training school in the city of York. And I'll always remember when I um, signed up, the recruiting sergeant said, you'll see the whole world. I had no idea it was going to start in the city of York because as we all know, <laughs> York is an absolute gem full of stories and um like like any 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 job you got weekends off and i'd go on ghost walks in york and i became quite fascinated by the stories and um in 1983 i started my very very first tour in my hometown of clitheroe in lancashire and from there it seems to have blossomed and blossomed but i'm really um a collector of ghost stories i'm not a medium not a psychic not a clairvoyant uh, I do believe there's another life after this one, mind you, but uh, I like to gather ghost stories so that if you do go to an event, you're not stuck for stories. They're all all up here. I don't know how you remember them. You associate each story with, with the story itself, really, and um, that way it just flows out, really. Yeah, you could say that. That's easy for you to say, isn't it? <laughs> I'd just go wrong. I'd just get the characters mixed up. I'd get the names mixed up and everything. Can we just say a quick hi to um, Patrick, Patricia? I can't remember your name again. Sarah Edwards, Jane. And uh, I bought something from HAPRC the other day. A lovely picture of James. I'll actually um, put a photo of it on the page later because it's dark and you can't see it. It's beautiful, Jane. Cheers. So what are you up to now then in the current situation? Well, um, COVID-19 has absolutely devastated my guided tours. Um, nearly every single day, Jacqueline, the government seemed to bring out a new law. So um, you don't know whether you're coming or going, really. I am told um, I can conduct a guided ghost walk outside with a maximum of 30 people, but they've got to be socially distanced and uh, hand sanitizer has got to be used and we're outside so it's it's not really dangerous but the government seem to change things every day really yeah but that's I've right lost, i've lost a huge amount of work uh, due to the pandemic yeah it's absolutely shock shocking and like how you know how people in that industry have to carry on and survive yeah you know, without any funds and they don't all get funding either do they no, I've got a very, very close friend from City of Canterbury Ghost Walks, John. He's uh, suffering badly. Um, but uh, also in York, they're not doing so well either, really, due to the uh, pandemic. And the City of Edinburgh as well has suffered very, very badly. But um, I just hope that next year will be a much better, brighter year for the whole country, really. Yeah, I think if people can get out, people are just going to get out and about so much, aren't they? They're really yeah. going to appreciate it as well. Really so. I've seen a lot of the actual ghost walks go out live onto Facebook now. Um, particularly, there's well, there's a couple from York at the moment, aren't there? Where you get the guided tours. Yeah, there's a fantastic tour guide called Mackenzie. 
Yes, she is brilliant. She is absolutely brilliant. And uh, she does the virtual tour as well, which is very clever, really. Very, very clever. I've been watching that one. She's she's just brilliant. Oh, she is. Knows her stuff. Okay, so um, you also do some paranormal events. Yeah, um, I get a lot of requests for Pendle Hill. And um, I live in Clitheroe, which is at the foot of Pendle Hill. And way back in 1612, a terrible event took place where 12 people were taken from the forest of Pendle, sent to Lancaster and York, and found guilty of witchcraft. Found guilty of the deaths of 17 local people by making clay pictures of human beings, uh, by cursing them. But what's um, quite amazing about the Pendlewick story is eight of those 12 people actually admitted to witchcraft. They actually admitted to witchcraft. Wow. The only window we have in the whole story is a book written by Thomas Potts in 1613. Thomas Potts was sent up from the city of London to oversee the proceedings in the city of Lancaster. And uh, we have to rely on that book being honest and truthful. What I can tell you is no one dared defend the Pendle Witches at Lancaster. There was indeed a jury, but there was no defence counsel because no one dared take on the King of England. And the king at that period of time was a very, very paranoid person. He believed that witches not only existed, he believed they were actually out to get him. On becoming king of England in 1603, he wrote a book called The Demonology Book. And you can buy The Demonology Book today from any leading bookshop. And as you pick it up, how to find a witch, how to try a witch, and how to eradicate a witch. And throughout the whole length of Great Britain, the Pendle region seemed to stick out like a sore thumb. It was isolated, it was away from society. And what made two of these witches so unique, uh, a lady called Anne Whittle and another lady called Elizabeth Southern, they were over 85 years old. They'd somehow defied the laws of nature because life expectancy, Jacqueline, in those days would be 35 if you were lucky. There's no doctors, there's no surgeries, there's no hospitals. And these two women had defied the laws of nature. And of course, it was so unusual to actually see an old person in those days. So they would have looked very, very mysterious and very unusual. It has been said that they knew all about plants. And of course, all modern medicines come from plants. And you've heard the, the word, an old wives remedy, uh, herbal remedies. And these women were selling uh, herbal remedies in the summer months, but in the winter, they were indeed begging and they made themselves very, very unpopular in the forest of Pendle. Right. Oh, wow. Well. It, it just seems an amazing area. Um, got a few, well, hopefully go to Pendle Hill from Haunted Antiques um, over Halloween. I'm not sure, obviously, if it can happen, but fingers crossed. So it's, it's a place like anybody who does like ghost hunting, we're all sort of drawn to that area. Well, it, it, it really is a very, very uh, atmospheric place. <clears throat> what I tend to do with the, um, the paranormal teams is I will take them to a place called Malkin Tower. Malkin Tower is the home of Elizabeth Southern and the Devise family. They were the main Pendle witches, and they lived in this one-roomed limestone cottage, a hovel. Malkin Tower sounds grand, doesn't it, really? But it would have been a hovel. They'd have lived in real, real poverty. So I take the group to the remains of the old cottage. I tell them the whole story and then they bring the mediums out. And some very, very strange things have happened there where, um, I don't know if you know Hazel Ford from Haunted Happenings. Yeah. Uh, they were doing some table tipping and this human tooth came from nowhere and hit the table. We all thought it's obviously a guest yeah. Hazel asked everyone. Now, we looked under the table, and it was a milk tooth uh, belonging to a child, a milk tooth. Wow. How it got there, we don't know. What That's we do crazy. know is um, on some occasions when we've been at Malkin Tower, this beautiful aroma has come from nowhere. It's filled the air with like a, a beautiful, gorgeous scent, like walking into a flower shop. And this has happened in the middle of winter, like December and January, which is quite amazing, really, Jacqueline. But um, 
Pendle Hill has been described as being seductive, hypnotic, and very, very atmospheric. And uh, we are approaching Halloween, and media attention always seems to focus on this story uh, around the Halloween period. What I would like to see, really, is someone like Steven Spielberg arrive and make a film, because there's been many documentaries, but never really a good quality Hollywood blockbuster. As long as it's realistic, though. Oh, gosh, yes. I <laughs> yeah, yeah. You don't want too much poetic license on it. Well, I could see Gwyneth Paltrow. I could see yeah. Helen Mirren, Meryl Streep, Judy Dench. Uh, I can see um, people like um, the great Ian Holm playing one of the uh, one of the judges, and Alison Devise would make a well. She could be played um, by um, who knows Posh Spice actually. So it might do quite well, really. <laughs> That'd be absolutely awesome cast, wasn't it? Fantastic. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so where else have you been in the country? Um, are there any specific places which draw you more than others? Yes, there is indeed, Jacqueline. I'm so glad you asked that question. And uh, in many ways, I'm answering indeed your first question tonight, really. How did I get involved in this? Well, I suppose really, in many ways, my dad. Now, he was a very, very down to earth sort of man, wouldn't lie about anything and didn't need to lie about this story. But way back in 1960, when I was just a little lad of five years old, my mum and dad bought this lovely house in South Cumbria. It was a Victorian house. And I remember at the age of five in December 1960, climbing on board the Pickford's vehicle with all the tea chests and um, full of furniture and cutlery and driving up to this place called Westmoreland, beautiful county in what we now call South Cumbria. And arrived at this lovely house, which was by itself uh, out in the fields there. And I just fell in love with the place straight away. Uh, however, I had no idea that my father was going to experience something very, very paranormal. Yeah. Um, I had my sister, who was only two years old at the time, my brother who was eight. And mum and dad made our beds up very, very quickly. And we all fell into a deep sleep as, as kids do. Mum and Dad continued to unload the tea chests, the cutlery, the furniture, etc. And around one o'clock, they thought they would turn in. They made their bed up. The last job that needed to be done was to put some curtains up, but it was a country house. There were no neighbours. So they climbed into bed, and after an exhausting night and an exhausting journey, they too fell into a deep sleep. My father turned over in bed and noticed the room was aglow with beautiful silver moonlight it was coming straight for the window he heard the sounds of tiny footsteps coming up the stairs the bedroom door slowly opened and in came a liver and white cocker spaniel and he thought how's that dog got in here i'm sure i shut the door downstairs he got out of bed and walked towards this spaniel it was in the corner of the room just looking at him, he put his hand on its collar, but his hand went straight through the dog. Oh, gosh. He was quite shocked, as you can imagine. Oh, yeah. He made, he made a second attempt. His hand went through the dog again. The dog then turned to look at the window in the bedroom and disappeared. Oh, my gosh. My father was in a state of shock. He sat on the end of the bed. My mum woke up with a jolt and said, oh, I've just had a strange dream. It was crystal clear, she said. I've just dreamt there's a man outside in Victorian clothing with a dog leading his hand, pointing up at our bedroom window. My father then told her what he'd seen and they put two and two together. Now, I was only a young lad of five, so mum and dad never told me until I was 15 years old. And it fascinated me, it really fascinated me. A year later, in 1973, they sold the house. I was heartbroken because I loved the building with all my heart. I had great uh, schoolmates there and I went to secondary modern school and primary school and really grew to love the building. And it broke my heart when we had to, to leave there, really. However, I had no idea that I was going to return in a most unusual, unusual fashion. The house was always in my thoughts, great memories of childhood, etc., and four years ago, my wife and I went on a P&O 
Mediterranean cruise. I'd never been to a cruise in my life before, and I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed it, visiting all those beautiful Mediterranean ports. Uh, they had what's called a black tie event on board, and I went down to the restaurant with my wife, and about two tables away, there was a young lady that kept looking at me and smiling, and I thought, I really cannot be that good looking. That's it. As it happened, she came across the table with a huge smile on her face and said, it's Simon, isn't it? Yes, I said. I'm from the village of Chapman, near Clitheroe, where you live. Oh, yes, I said. She said, I'm the events manager on the Oceana, the p &O, uh, cruise ship Oceana. I said, oh, fantastic job. That I said, Simon, I've been on one or two of your tours. I quite like them. We're always looking for something different on board the vessel. Um, have you thought about doing a PowerPoint show on ghosts, murders and mysteries? I said, well, Louise, would they really like that? Well, you can always try. She gave me an email address when I got back to England and I emailed P&O. Much to my surprise, within three days, they'd got back to me and said I could audition at Sussex or Cumbria. And I thought, well, Cumbria's up the road from where I live. So there was no um, option, really. Um, I was given a telephone number to telephone the cruise director, a lady called Maureen, and I had a good chat to her. She said, Simon, uh, just bring your laptop and uh, your stories and we'll have the audition at my home. She gave me a sat-nav code, which I just put into my car and set off. I found myself driving over the beautiful trough of Boland, down into Lancaster City, itself then up the a65 and straight towards uh the village of hevisham where i went to primary school um and then over what's called hevisham head and then down a driveway which looked very very familiar and straight up to the house that my dad had bought in 1960. when i got there i was quite shocked maureen had bought the house in the 1980s and when she, when i knocked on the door she opened the door she said you look a bit jaded simon I said, well, Maureen, I know you won't believe this, but I used to live here. No, she said. I said, yeah, I used to live here. Um, she said, I'll make you a cup of tea. Went to the front room and I looked at the familiar ceiling. The doorknobs had not changed. The floor hadn't changed. The fireplace was just the same. She made me a cup of tea and then I had a good chat to her about my childhood. And then I mentioned my father's experience. The cup and saucer fell through her fingers and smashed on the floor. Her eyes widened with shock. She said, Simon, my brother lives in London. Every Christmas, he comes up to stay with me and my husband. And the very first Christmas he stayed here, he was in bed Christmas Eve upstairs. The door slowly opened and in came a liver and white cocker spaniel. I looked at the ceiling and said, Oh, Dad, you were right. You were right. It's almost as if the house wanted me back again. Uh, the chance that happened, I'm told, Jacqueline, are about 44 million to one against. But I swear to you, it is a true story. As for the audition, I couldn't do it. I was just too emotionally, emotionally yeah. charged. I just, I just couldn't do it, really. That's absolutely, That's absolutely amazing. amazing. Kind of gets yeah. Yeah. But uh, uh, obviously, my father he saw the ghost dog, and he wouldn't lie about it. And when when Maureen's brother had seen the same dog, he just confirmed it. It just confirmed it, really. That's fantastic. Just just to get the same thing as well. Amazing, absolutely and amazing. How on earth you've ended up at that house? And you have so many coincidences within the paranormal field. It's odd how it happens, really. Um, so when I drove up the drive and parked outside that door, um, it just absolutely blew my mind away. It really did, really did. I bet it did. But it seems, in a way, you hadn't been anywhere, you know, in all the years it just disappeared from when you'd last been there. Oh, beautiful place, though. Uh, still got some great memories of that. Yeah. Oh, that must be amazing. So... You've encountered one or two things there. What was the scariest thing you actually encountered? Um, for me, um, it would in fact be at, um, it wasn't actually a ghost walk. It was at a place called the Sunken Lane on the Somme battlefield. 
and um, I do quite a few um, tours relating to World War One, World War Two, and uh, the sunken lane is still there to this very, very day. It's actually a dip. Um, you imagine a limestone outcrop with um, a dip in between. Uh, in World War One, of course, it was used to, to protect uh, troops, etc., etc. And um, there's a very, very touching story relating to it, which has a connection with the scariest thing I've ever seen, really. Um, in 1916, a gentleman called Geoffrey Mallins was sent to the sunken lane with a camera, a hand crank camera. It was absolutely imperative that he got there and imperative that he got back again because what he was going to film was this huge underground explosion. The British engineers have been digging deep under the German trenches and they created a huge cavern underneath them and they filled it with TNT. Manners' job was to film the explosion. He looked at his stopwatch and exactly seven, seven o'clock on the 1st of July 1916, the British pulled the plungers down and this huge explosion erupted. You can actually see that explosion on YouTube under the sunken lane but this is where the story gets quite quite convincing really malins had a platoon of men with him who were bodyguards and these men were highly professional soldiers from the lancashire fusiliers they'd all been in gallipoli they were they'd all shall i say been blooded if you will and their job was to look after him malins has filmed the explosion he then turns the camera on the boys in the sunken lane and some are smoking they're all sitting down the lane with their rifles fixed bayonets fixed and some are waving at the camera and um quite recently uh scotland yard looked at the film because they employed a young lady who was a very very good lip reader and for the very first time she could read what these lads were saying on their lips and a lot of them were saying using quite a lot of naughty language as you can imagine and the odd swear word that was quite touching one lad was called billy haynes and he came from bury in lancashire and his words were my wife's going to be a widower tomorrow what is so deeply touching is that within 15 minutes every single man in that trench in the sunken lane had been killed every one oh, of them had been killed malins got back with his camera he was the only survivor uh but i've taken groups uh into the sunken lane i tell them all about malins's story and the the western front offensive uh but i went in there by myself uh some time ago uh and um just had a silent a silent walk down the sunken lane and i heard a german voice uh the games many herren uh, bist du glücklich um hello my friend are you happy i turned round there was absolutely no one there at all okay. the sunken lane is quite deep you can see in front of you you can see behind you there was absolutely no one there at all but i'm told it is indeed haunted not by a british tommy but by a german soldier who's somehow locked in a time warp in the sunken lane oh wow bless him but um that was quite because i the hair actually rose in the back of my head and i actually felt i was being watched and then when i heard it was so clear it was very very clear and there was no one else in the, in the lane with me whatsoever oh way uh jane's actually been to uh the crater oh yes yeah yeah she's been there uh, uh, it's, it's a huge crater it. yes it's 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 very very near the sunken lane very very near the sunken lane yeah not in the that, that jane might have uh, picked something up as well yeah um so jane's the medium at haunted antiques uh so yeah she yeah uh, picks everything up amazing I mean, it, it really is a very, very atmospheric place, the Somme battlefield. And particularly when you uh, leave the Menin Gate and make your way up to the Somme, uh, it, it, of course, the, the area was basically a bloodbath for not only the Brits, but the Canadians, Australians, Indians, and of course, the Germans, who were very, very highly professional lads. Uh, there is a, one story I'd like to, to bring in as well, actually. It's a, a ghost story. Uh, relating to that same day really and it's really a ghost story an affair of the heart this one Jacqueline about a young lad um, called Jonathan Hesketh and John's only crime in life was to be born at the wrong time of the last century 
Um, he attended a primary school, a place called Worley in, near Blackman. I had a good friend called Annie Cresswell, and these two were inseparable. Absolutely inseparable. By the time I was 16, they were literally inseparable. They married each other after their 18th birthdays and had a beautiful honeymoon on the Isle of Man. On coming back from the Isle of Man, John was horrified to find waiting for him his call-up papers. Oh, no, I've got no gripe with the Germans. I haven't even seen a German. I'm not to join the army. I just got married. He had no option. He was conscripted. Sent to Burnley, Rosegrove Burnley, to his training. Taught how to press his kit, clean his Lee Enfield rifle, bull his boots. He then had seven days leave with his beloved Annie. Every second, every minute, every hour, every day meant so much to this young boy because he knew he was not going to see his 19th birthday. He passionately kissed young Annie for the last time in the railway station and as the train pulled out, the only thing that could have helped him was the fact that nearly every man on that train was going through exactly the same deep, deep sadness. They got to the Somme battlefield on the 1st of July 1916. None of them had any idea it was going to be the blackest day in the history of the British Armed Forces. As Johnny and his mates made their way up to the communication trenches to the front line, the sergeant major said, Right, lads, uh, quickly write a letter to your loved ones. John took his haversack off and quickly wrote a letter to young Annie, placed the letter in an envelope, and the sergeant major took each letter from each platoon member, withdrew his bayonet and skewered them that kept the bayonet point clear, and then put the bayonet point into the sandbag above his head. At exactly 7.30 on the 1st of July 1916, these boys left the trenches down a 25 mile line. It was the blackest day in the history of the British Armed Forces. Boys from all over Great Britain lost their lives that day. 20,000 before 12 o'clock and another 15,000 later on. In one day, one of the first casualties was young Jonathan Hesketh. His young wife uh, in the village of Worley felt there's something wrong. It was almost like telepathic. She knew there was something wrong. For seven days, that poor girl couldn't sleep, she couldn't eat. All she had on her mind was young John. On the 11th day, a postman arrived at number 21 King Street, Worley, and placed a letter through the letterbox. As the letter hit the doormat, she came rushing into the front room and saw the letter, and saw her name in it, and a strange tear in the corner of the letter. She had no idea it's where the Sergeant Major's Bennett had pierced the letter. She opened the letter. And the only reason this story has continued is in those seven days leave, Annie conceived. And I met her granddaughter, who now lives in the city of Preston. She showed me the letter, and it was a very, very dearly treasured family heirloom. Wow. She opened the letter. She wouldn't let me touch it, but uh, I could read it. The words were, dear Annie, you are the love of my life. I worship the very ground you walk on. If I cannot come back to the form of a human being, I swear to you, I will come back to the form of a ghost and say goodbye to you in the corner of the Western Gatehouse where we played as children. A lot of the words have become quite badly smudged. And Annie's granddaughter informed me that when her grandmother read the letter, the tears streamed down her cheeks and smudged the actual ink. Before I left her home that day, I very, very diplomatically asked her if her grandmother went to the Western Gatehouse. Oh, she did, she said. She did. Did she see him? Not at first she didn't, but she could smell him. She could detect him. And apparently as human beings, we all have a different aroma, a different scent, a bit like DNA, I suppose, really. He then made an appearance and she tried to grab him, but each time she grabbed him, her hands went straight through him. He then turned, smiled and made his way to the next world. Annie yeah. was 18 with child. She never, ever remarried, died in 1977. And all she had on her lips was the name of young Jonathan Hesketh, whose only crime in life was to be born at the wrong time of the last century. A very touching story, Jacqueline. Yeah, there's um, so many people lost and one of my relatives died and ended up on the beaches in France. And to actually find like an individual story and see the letter and 
sort of meet people who who know of it and that it still exists. It's absolutely amazing, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, a bit of piece of living history. That, but I mean, your your great city, the city of Nottingham, has produced many many Victoria crosses, and um, by far the most famous was Captain Albert Ball. What a character he was! Now, for some viewers, you may have heard of a chap called Biggles, who of course was a, a, a fictitious character. But many many people believe that Albert Ball was indeed Biggles. He was scared of nothing absolutely scared of nothing as a young lad in the city of nottingham just for a bit of fun he would climb the chimneys of the lace factory he would actually climb them without a yeah. get to the top of the chimney run round. his mum and dad were shouting and screaming get down get down he was fearless he joined the the famous sherwood foresters one of the most famous infantry regiments in great britain and um he then joined what's called the Royal Flying Corps. Now, you can imagine taking off in a string bag, a, a biplane uh, made of canvas in itself was a great skill, but he became an air ace, shooting down many, many German aircraft. Um, he had quite a few conflicts with the famous Red Baron, uh, Baron Richthofen Circus. Uh, sadly, he lost his life in 1917. But because of his skills and fearless attitude and the amount of German aircraft he shot down, he became one of Nottingham's most famous sons. And uh, to this very, very day, you mention Albert Ball and everyone thinks of Nottingham. A great, great character. That's fantastic. One of my neighbours, um, one of their relatives actually got one of those as well. Which, you know, it's just unbelievable. You know, the Stuart Foresters that they had. Doing. Yeah, the Sherwood Foresters, they were first ashore at Anzio, uh, 1943, a uh, great regiment. And there were desert rats as well, of course. Yes, uh, I've heard of that one, yeah. Brilliant bunch of lads, the Sherwood Foresters, great regiment. Yeah, say hello to a few. Hi to Nick Millay, who's been a guest on the show before. Hi to Wild Bill, Annalise, Mark. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. If anyone's got any questions for Simon... Would you like to add them to the chat? That'd be amazing. I'd be more than happy to, Jacqueline. Thank you. So if anybody's got anything you want to ask, I first met you at Derby Jail. I believe it was Richard Felix's Christmas party. Yes. Yeah, that was, that, that, interviewing him. that was a really good night. I'd, I, I'd never met Richard before, but uh, what a nice guy. What a great character. And also Ashley, who's the um, proprietor at the, uh, the police museum there, um, Ashley Waterhouse, lovely lad to talk to. Yeah, he's moved on now. Um, the jail, they've kind of opened up two rooms. So right. there's two extra rooms opened up. But yeah, the police museum's actually moved on now. Right. Yeah, I was actually at the jail um, <laughs> well, a couple of weekends ago. So yeah. <laughs> but well, yeah, it's local to me, isn't it? So yeah, it's quite a cool place. But so, uh, Richard, he uh, certainly knows his stuff, doesn't he, really? And, uh, of course, definitely. Richard started the, the Ghost Walks in Derby, and uh, I believe they were very, very successful. That's right. Um, also, um, I wonder about uh, the experience you had in the house, well, what your father had, Yeah. Uh, whether it was um, an image which kept replaying. Well, um, Mum and Dad, they did some research in the house, and it was a huge, huge building. Um, now, when my dad bought the house, um, he bought a section. It had been split into three separate dwellings. Um, but my, my dad bought the, um, the east side of the house. But before then, of course, in the Victorian times when it was built, it was actually built for the High Sheriff of Westmoreland. The High Sheriff is actually his own personal property. There were some stables nearby. And um, I did some research um oh gosh, in the 1980s, and found that they also had their own pack of gun dogs. Uh -huh. And um, I, I would like to think that this was one of the gun dogs that loved the building so much, it couldn't bear to leave it. I did have a chat to my mum, who sadly died a good 10 years ago, and she described the person in the Victorian clothing looking at the window with a dog lead very, very clearly. And from looking at books relating to the High Sheriff of Westmond, it sounds very likely that she saw him. It seems that he is also 
haunting the building. It's a bit like a time warp, isn't it, really? A bit like a time warp, but I, I find it all fascinating, fascinating stuff, really. Yeah, I love it, which is why I sort of do it most weekends. Yeah. It's quite addictive. Oh, gosh, yeah. 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 So when you've done a ghost hunt, what's been your favourite location? Uh, my favourite location, I think, has to be City of York. I have done tours yeah. in New York. Um, by taking a coach group in there, um, I, I never, ever step on Mackenzie or Trevor Rooney's feet, um, but uh, I would bring, shall I say, if I get like a, a booking from outside the area, I'd bring the coach into York and take them around the city. Uh, it's a place I never, ever get tired of, really. And, of course, the city has some truly, truly gorgeous ghostly tales as well. Yeah, it's a beautiful place. I love it there. Yeah, yeah. I certainly don't get up there enough, to be honest. But, yeah, it's amazing. Um, got a question from Annalise Wire. What part of Norfolk would you like to investigate? Uh, I think it would have to be the Norfolk Broads. It would have to be the Norfolk Broads. But there is actually a very, very gorgeous ghost story from the Broads. And um, I'm going to deep dig deep into my brain here. Um, it was the, a, a gorgeous story, a little village called Wellingham, near, near the Broads. And um, the story of a, a very, very beautiful young girl of the name of uh, Anne Gill. And Anne had a boyfriend called John Bodneys. They were very, very close. And uh, Bodneys uh, disappeared for a few weeks. And when he came back, he was horrified to find that uh, Anne had got engaged to a very, very wealthy local chap called John Ambrose. And he was quite shocked. And uh, he, he went to see her the night before the, the wedding was going to take place. And she disappeared. Um, she disappeared from her room. Now, when Ambrose came the following day for the, to the church for the wedding, he was horrified that she never, never arrived and was absolutely heartbroken. Um, Anna just literally disappeared. Her mother and father were quite shocked. And of course, the villagers were quite shocked as well. However, 20 years later, there was this terrific storm, a terrific storm. And a lightning bolt hit a huge oak tree near the local public house. As the oak tree fell, its roots dragged up tons and tons of earth. And beneath it was a skeleton. And on the skeleton was a large ring and it was ascertained that this was indeed the body of Anne Gill. Uh, her relatives, of course, were, were quite glad that they knew what had happened to her, terrified that she'd been obviously murdered. She'd been murdered near the tree and buried beneath the tree. 20 years later, uh, John Bodnes uh, came back to the village and went to the local village pub. And uh, as he went into the village pub, he um, bought a beer, and looked in the wall and could see a withered hand in a glass vase. And uh, he said, Who's ha whose hand is that? What's it doing there? Oh, that is the hand of young Anne, who was murdered at least 20 years ago. He then began to scream and felt pressure on his neck. And people were quite horrified. He was swimming the floor. They tried to help him, but his larynx was being closed by the invisible hand. It seems that Anne had got a revenge on John Bodnes for the murder all those years ago. That, that's absolutely amazing. Uh, Nick actually absolutely loves this story. It, it is pretty uh, good story, yeah. Have a question yeah. here from Jane then. Uh, so what are your thoughts on Scottish folklore, Sawney Bean? Is there any merit to the story or is it just a myth? Well, um, Scotland, of course, is a, a fabulous, fabulous country with lots and lots of myths and legends. Uh, I'm certainly not an expert on that story. I've heard it, of course, but I'm certainly not an expert. But um, I do know that the Romans, of course, built a, built a wall to keep them out, didn't they, really? Because they were quite fearsome people. And a lot of these stories would date back to the time of that period of time, really. But I'm certainly not qualified to answer that question, really. Right. Thanks anyway. Go say hi to Tommy Petty from Valley Spirit Communications. Hi to California. We've got Wild Bill and Nick Malay. They're all from the US. 
so we've got quite a few watching so any questions from the us for us so uh what are your plans then um you would, uh annalise says wow so annalise is impressed well that's very nice we to say so very it's, yeah. it's nice to have, a, it's nice to have a, a worldwide audience as well isn't it really and, that's, uh, right. that's brilliant and thanks for watching everybody it's, it's the beauty of uh, a live broadcast isn't it really jacqueline to get people from across the across the planet and of course our good american cousins speak the same language which does help um i've got to say i was in um, philadelphia a gorgeous city uh some years ago and um i got into a double decker bus in philadelphia went round the whole city down independence mall where the uh, declaration was actually signed wow and uh, past the Liberty Bell, which of course was made in England. And then the guide, she had a microphone and she said, and there, on the left there, we got Pendle Hill. Sorry, Pendle Hill? And she was pointing at a beautiful, beautiful white building. Pendle Hill, Quaker movement. And that's exactly where it started. The Quaker movement started on Pendle Hill. A oh. chap called George Fox, now, George has to be one of the bravest men ever to walk Great Britain because he was arrested time and time again from Leicestershire right at the borders and right down, down to Lincolnshire, right down to London for blasphemy. And he said, you don't need to go to church to be a... And uh, you don't need to uh, go to college to become a priest. This was classed as blasphemy. He formed calls who was sent to death 15 times, but was always reprieved. And uh, after um, well, after 1640, uh, 1650, this country became a republic and was run by Oliver Cromwell. And Cromwell heard about this man causing lots of grief everywhere. He said, I want to see this man. So uh, George Fox was brought to uh, Cromwell's headquarters and Fox reduced him to tears. And Cromwell said, look, this man's done nothing wrong. Just let him go. He made his way straight across the Atlantic Ocean to Pennsylvania. And of course, William Penn was a great, great Quaker. And uh, of course, in the USA, the Quaker movement is taken very, very seriously. And I do get a lot of American and, and Canadians that will come over to my part of the world to, just to look at Pendle Hill to take in the George Fox story. But um, he certainly felt a lot more happier in America than England because it was a lot more freedom of speech and um, to see this lovely white building in Philadelphia was fantastic it really was yeah well Bill says they don't have areas like the UK does uh, a few hundred years old rather than sort of like ours but there's still history out there oh uh, yeah this guy I know who spent a lot of time at Gettysburg oh gosh Gosh. Sounds an amazing place. Uh, absolutely fascinating. Fascinating. Um, one of my stories um, does, in fact, involve a, a most amazing chap called John Creesap. Now, John was a British Army officer, and he married a, a lovely girl called Gail John Braddell uh, way back in uh, October 1773. He was then sent over to what was indeed the British colonies, in North America and he went to Philadelphia he also went to Pittsburgh and Boston New England his wife loved New England and she said oh John why don't you resign your commission and become a civilian this country is the land of opportunity he thought marvelous I'm sick of the army anyway so uh, they started their own business uh, in New England were doing very 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 well their next door neighbors are doing very well one person that recognised this more than anyone else was good old King George back in England. And he thought, you know, these people need taxing and taxing and taxing again. John said to his wife, I'm working my socks off and all I'm doing is paying tax to England. Sick and tired of it, he said. He then met a gentleman called George Washington. Now, George Washington's family came from North Lancashire, a place called Yelland Redmayne. And Washington recognised Cresap's northern English accent and said, uh, John, I believe you've served the British 
army I know all about british army infantry tactics because i'd like to throw the british of north america this country needs to be independent will you join me i will join you i'm sick and tired of this taxation it's got beyond a joke this country needs to be independent so john creasat became what's called a pathfinder general in washington's forces he was at lexington concord bunker hill ticonderoga uh, and the final surrender at yorktown in 1781 when the French helped the North American rebels under Washington and the British surrendered. Uh, for them, it was actually very, very embarrassing because Great Britain at that period of time was a superpower and they blamed the French more than the American rebels. Really. But America then became independent and um, George Washington summoned John Creese up to his headquarters. Ah, John, I'd like to uh, offer you a position in the new United States Armed Forces as a general, you take up this position. I will, sir. My job for you now is to encourage, to encourage the natives to leave New Hampshire, New Jersey, New England. Will you carry this out? He did do. It's fair to say that John Creesup did have the blood of many an innocent squaw and many an innocent brave in his hands. However, all good things come to an end. When he was captured by the Huron, uh, North American Canadian Indians, all his men were dispatched. He was tied to the totem pole, a bit like a John Wayne movie, really. Now, Creesup was a Yorkshire lad, and Yorkshire people can be very, very stubborn. In fact, Sir Ralph Fiennes will take no one from Yorkshire on any of his tours because they like to whinge and complain about everything. <laughs> Creesup was no different. Tied to the totem pole, showed no emotion whatsoever was heard to say the words, you'll get nout from me. The Indians couldn't believe, couldn't believe this. He was showing no fear. He wasn't frightened to die. They became frightened of him. They released his bonds. He rushed into the forest, got back to Washington's headquarters. Uh, sir, I've really had enough of this, sir. I think I'd like to return to my native county of Yorkshire in the north of England, sir. Washington was quite shocked. John, my country is indebted to you. You will always be an American citizen. Well, he got back to what we call the West Riding of Yorkshire, Craven District. He's buried at New Pudsey, Bradford. Every 4th of July, a member of the American Embassy will make his or her way up to Bradford to make sure the grave's been polished and some fresh flowers placed on top of it. It proudly says on the grave headstone, General John Creesup, United States Armed Forces. And to this very, very day, the Pentagon are responsible for the grave. They've actually bought the grave and they are responsible for it. You could say he's the all American, all Yorkshire hero. The it's great story. Fantastic. I've got Wild Bill here. His bloodline goes back uh, further than the Pilgrims. Wow. Wow, that, 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 that's absolutely amazing. The, the Pilgrim story, that, that's truly amazing. At Plymouth Rock, I mean, they, they must have been tough guys, those gentlemen. They must have been very, very tough people. There's no two ways about it, really. Discovering the new world. That's right. And uh, Bob didn't even know that we could get that far, you know, just setting out to wherever, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. To, um, of course, America was independent after 1781 and became very, very strong with her own army, her own navy. But there was still a lot of um, ill feeling towards the United Kingdom. And Canada, in particular Canada, which of course was a British Commonwealth. And uh, in 1814, American soldiers came over the border into Canada and set fire to Canadian buildings, Canadian government buildings. Now, Canada was horrified. They contacted England and Lord Wellington, a horse guard in London, assembled his senior officers. Uh, gentlemen, we need to do something in retaliation to these American incursions into Canada. He summoned uh, Admiral Cockburn of the Royal Navy, um, Major General Ross of horse guards, and they thought of this incredible raid, which has gone down in history as one of the most famous commando raids in history. Major General Ross chose the Royal Scots 
the uh, Royal Green Jackets, the York and Lancasters, and a detachment of Royal Marines. And they set off from England, uh, 32 warships, and made their way straight up the Potomac River towards Washington. Of course, there's lots of scouts on the Potomac River sending information back to Washington. And President Madison said, uh, don't worry, these uh, limeys, when they arrive, we'll just uh, set our cannon on them and we'll get our cavalry and we'll wipe them out. We know these limeys, when they land, they're just going to get the fife and drums and make a lot of noise and we'll <laughs> wipe them out. However, Wellington uh, thought, let's try some different tactics this time. He said, as soon as you land, boys, don't wait for us. Just go inland. Of course, the Royal Green Jackets were light infantry and they could shift. And as soon as they landed, they didn't wait for the main bolt. They just advanced deep into the Blandenburg Heights and straight towards Washington. Uh, one Royal Scots officer mentioned it was hard to keep up with the American defenders because they were running away too fast. They got into a deserted Washington on the 24th of August, 1814. Um, as Major General Ross and the senior officers made their way inside the White House, they found all the tables had been laid out with the finest cut warm stew. There was wine on every table. And this was to celebrate the American victory, which um, General, uh, which uh, President Madison was convinced would happen. But, of course, the Brits had got into Washington there, the very heart of the USA. Uh, they had a, a fantastic meal. One Royal Green Jacket officer, uh, Major Slayburn, made his way upstairs into the president's bedroom and helped himself to his, his shirts. He helped himself to a huge pile of love letters. And in 1986, these love letters arose at the Antiques Roadshow in Brighton, which had been wow. written by the president himself. They then got all the chairs and tables together and they set fire to the White House. The roof caved in. They went to the congressional building, set fire to that. And they sunk every American warship in the harbour. But they made their way back to their warships and got back to England. However, uh, one young lady that day was definitely very, very brave. She was called Dolly Madison and she has to be one of America's most famous female heroes and what a hero whilst her husband ran away with the uh, the white house staff she stayed with a knife she cut away at the canvas of george washington rolled it into a scroll and escaped around the back of the building as the first scottish soldier came up the stairways into the bedroom and uh, she saved the painting of course of the most famous of all american presidents as the white house this very very day they do have guided tours there, I'm told. And as a reminder of that, that day in August 1814, there are still scorch marks on one of the walls which has been left there deliberately uh, as a memento of that, uh, you could say, rather sad day, really, in America's history. However, I do believe that the Star Spangled Banner was actually conceived that night. And the Americans got their revenge at the Battle of New Orleans, where Major General Ross was going to lose his life, along with a lot of other... British redcoats, but um, we are good friends now, folks, and uh, yeah. <laughs> we, still, we still speak the same language, which is great, really. Of course it is. Yeah, I've been kind of speaking to Americans more, like, with Facebook. You know, yeah. we yeah. all do the same thing. We go out investigating. It's really cool, and finding their their techniques out and their stories. It's brilliant. Yeah. As I say, the, the language barrier is great because it doesn't, it's not there, is it? And uh, I found that when I've been in America, it's you sometimes feel that you're not really abroad because everyone speaks the same language. It's uh, you feel more at home there than in France or Germany or uh, Holland. <laughs> uh, oh, wow! Well, Bill says uh, okay. So it's country to believe. It's been proven she did not sew the flag like many think. Right, I wouldn't know that, Bill. I know that she's a very famous woman, though, uh, Dolly Dolly Madison. In fact, they say her ghost actually haunts the White House. And one person who actually saw her was none other than Winston Churchill. And uh, he was actually um, in one of those huge reception rooms there, enjoying a, enjoying a brandy and a cigar. And he saw the ghost of Dolly. It said that he also saw the ghost of President Lincoln as well. Uh, so it must, be, it must be a very, 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 very building, that really. That's amazing. I like this comment by Jane. 
So uh, Jane says, America is what happens when you leave a load of dodgy yeah. Brits and Irish folk unsupervised for 200 years. What did you yeah. say, Wild Bill? <laughs> and Nick? <laughs> That's fantastic. Uh, I just want to thank you for appearing on the show tonight. It's been a really amazing. And wow, you know, stories from everywhere. I just don't know how you remember them. Well, uh, well, you know, being a tour guide, of course, you, uh, I use a lot of her heritage, ghosts, murders. Uh, I've got some pr pretty horrible murders, Jacqueline. If we do this again, perhaps I should bring some of the most famous murders in Great Britain to life, uh, which, sadly, there's quite a few. That's right. Um, also, uh, you've just released something onto YouTube. The video. Yes, uh, due to the pandemic. That's right, due to the pandemic, um, I've had no work at all, but um, I've done some filming uh, at one of the oldest halls in Great Britain called Salisbury Hall. If you go to YouTube, put um, Simon Edsall, Tales from the Grave, Salisbury Hall, and it's a whole feature, including, would you believe, John Creesap, that story you heard before. I watched it last night. It's absolutely amazing. I loved it. Oh, that's nice to um, say so, Jack. Thank um, you. I want to wish you all the luck anyway with the ghost walks. And Thank you, dear. It's, it's been a pleasure. Really. I'll uh, try and post the YouTube link to the chat here as well so people can find it. Um, any last questions, anybody? Quick one. Hey, not that quick. I think it was about two minute delay anyway. <laughs> oh, it's well built. Um, Wild Bill associates with Native, Native American, not European. He has less than 20% German in him. Okay, cheers, Wild Bill. Thanks mm. for watching, Nick. Yeah, you're a great storyteller there, Simon. Well, it's very kind of Nick to say that. Thank you, Nick. Greatly appreciated. Cheers, great Nick. Uh, Wild Bill, love the show. Great night, Annalise. Jane Rowley, great show, guys. Thanks very much for listening. Thank you for watching and good night. Have a good, good night, night everyone. Oh, well, Jane wants to know when your next ghost walk is. The sound's gone. Hello there. Hello. <laughs> I just got a last minute question in there. When's uh, your next, next ghost, ghost walk? Jane? Well, I'm going to organise a few just before Halloween. Um, I can only take out 30 people at a time, actually. So I'm going to do them in um, four different venues, building up to Halloween, and then do two on Halloween itself. So, um, we are living in some very, very strange times, really. So um, I won't expect big crowds because I'm only allowed 30, 30 oh. maximum, and that's with social distancing as well, of course. Yeah. Uh, okay, then. Good luck to you anyway, Simon. And Thank thanks you, for listening, Jackie. everyone. Lovely talking to you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, and good night. Have a good night. Bye. <laughs>